This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app to listen on your iPhone or Android phone on demand. A contractor ever tell you the price of something and it sounds so high you think, eh, maybe I'll try it myself. Some jobs just aren't that difficult, and yes, you can do it. If you want to find out how to do those things, listen to Fix It 101, podcast everywhere. MPB Think Radio, this is Creature Comforts, the show all about your animals and the animals around you. Kevin Farrell here with Dr. Troy Major, veterinarian at the Animal Medical Center in Jackson, and Libby Hartfield, retired director of the Mississippi Museum of Natural Science. Well, the weather's getting cooler, and we've got some rain in Mississippi finally, and certain, certainly in certain some parts of the state. So Mississippi's waterways, lakes, ponds, and rivers are finally filling back up. That means it's a great time to get out your equipment and gear to go fishing. For today's show, we'll welcome back Dennis Rickey, coordinator with the Mississippi Department of Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks, who has this to say. Going fishing is a joy. Catching fish is a bonus. Every angler has their favorite fishing story, so we want to hear yours today. Also, Dr. Major will be on the line throughout the hour, ready to take your pet questions. You can email the show by sending it to animals at mpbonline.org. And if you miss the Creature Comforts broadcast on Thursday, it repeats every Saturday morning at 6. So good morning, Libby. Let's uh, start out with you. Give us an idea of what you've been seeing in your yard here recently. Good morning, Kevin. Well, first off, it's nice to see moisture, isn't it? <laughs> to see, yeah. yeah, just happy to see that. And I think everything in my yard was happy. I uh, saw several of those scurrying around, and um, they looked glistening and wet. Um, I've been watching woodpeckers this week, and um, I do think I've got several trees that are in the process of dying, a combination of that late freeze and now two months with no water, I think is really hard on my trees. But anyway, so I've been watching for yellow-bellied sapsuckers, and give us a call if you've already seen your yellow-bellied sapsuckers. Mine haven't seemed to have returned yet. I've got pileated woodpeckers and red-bellied woodpeckers and red-headed woodpeckers all going about their business, so that's been fun, and uh, no lizards are around. Um, all of my big spiders, my garden spiders and RGO spiders, they're, they seem to have all passed on. I guess it, we've had enough cold weather for that, but I'm wondering if anybody else is seeing spiders in their yards. And then Paul and I like to go outside at night and you know, small walks, especially when the moon is bright. So we took a little walk last night, and we're out some rest of the— now that it's getting dark earlier, it's it's easy to spend some time outside. So I guess I would encourage everybody to get outside a little bit at night, too. And I've heard great horned owls. Let's see, we saw an adult fox just— you know, going about their business, and a baby possum that looked very lost wandering around. Didn't see any bats last night, uh, but the great horned owls were fun. This is starting to be, you know, their time of the year, December, January, February. You're going to hear them a lot because they'll be nesting. They they hoot all year long because they're always defending that territory to some extent. But when they start um, mating and nesting, that's when they're really going to get loud. So um, I guess I would encourage everybody to get outside and watch their woodpeckers, and then at night watch, listen for your owls and um, try to find some bats. I didn't find bats last night. I'm, I'm going to keep looking. All right. This is Creature Comforts on MPB Think Radio. Joining us as he does uh, each week from his clinic in Jackson, Dr. Troy Major. So, Dr. Major, we'll start off with uh, an, a question from our producer, Abram Nanny, who says, we have a puppy that just recently has grown enough to escape her crate while we're gone and gets quite destructive when she's not attended to. Any thoughts on what to do? Maybe uh, reinforce the crate somehow? Maybe something that would uh, distract the dog, keep them occupied when no one's around? You know, that's a, that's a great question. It, it does it does involve a lot of people, you know, as far as the destructiveness of a puppy. And in a large account, I don't know what kind of dog this is, but still, uh, they can all, during the first even year, uh, cause them some damage. 
I would suggest a better crate, first of all, especially if they're gone for a duration of any time, with plenty of room um, for the puppy there. A few toys. I wouldn't overdo the toys. Um, be careful with toys also. If you have a dog that is prone to chew and eat the toys, uh, be careful with anything that the puppy might be eating on. You could swallow. We have a, a case of that probably once a week or maybe more. Uh, where they swallow a toy or part of a toy and can't pass it, so they can be a problem. But I think a bigger cage, a more sturdy cage, and obviously one with the top on it, uh, if this puppy can crawl out. You know, I don't know why I'm so fascinated, but I love those dog things, the toys that you stick the treat inside and the dog has to kind of find it in there. And even my sister, I think, has a a feeding mat that has a similar sort of thing. So would that be something if uh, maybe a toy because it's it makes the dog work a little bit more and again, maybe keeps them distracted for part of the day? Right. A lot of it depends on the uh, curiosity and the intelligence of the dog, obviously. But uh, we have some dogs that may get all the good stuff out of that in just a few minutes others might work on it for hours i would try anything like that though to occupy the dog i think that would be good uh, how old is this dog did they say uh she's about six or seven months six or seven months and she stays confined how many hours a day uh, it really depends. At most, it's maybe three hours. Um, but she could, if if we left her for thirty minutes, she would do the same thing. <laughs> okay, I understand. Well, frequency of getting out, uh, you know, going to the bathroom, occupying her a little bit, but I would suggest a better kennel right now, simply because uh, she needs to understand that she cannot get out and tear up the house. Uh, she's too young to be trying any medication i would think for that so uh, it's a problem but just um, being Benny and hang in there i like the idea of the toys that might occupy occupy her time and this is <clears throat> somewhat maybe to the extreme but it's i guess somewhat puppy behavior and, and part of this hopefully dog owners would expect that some of this behavior they grow out of absolutely and uh that is a problem uh, if they don't outgrow it. But most dogs during the teething, teething stage and the puppy stage will literally uh, chew on anything that they can find to chew on or tear up. So usually by the time most dogs reach eight months to a year, they settle down and are not that destructive. And Abram, what kind of dog is this? She is a uh, Great Pyrenees and English Mastiff mix. Okay. She's large for six or seven months. She's a she's a big girl. Not, not, a, not a small dog. You know, gosh, I don't know if that crosses. She's going to be a huge dog. I hope she has good joints and doesn't have any problem as she gets bigger um, in, in her motions. I'd say this. Uh, she does need to be in a place where she can't tear it up or get out. That is a challenge with the dog that's big. What does she weigh now? Uh, we just weighed her the other day. I think she was 65 pounds. Right, and she's six months old. <laughs> so, yeah, so she's going to be a big dog. And in my experience, usually the, the uh, Great Pyrenees and uh, Mastiff, most of the Mastiff breeds are fairly non-destructive, but uh, maybe the cross. But I think it's the puppy stage, really. I think that's what's going on. And... Uh, just really find what you can to occupy when you're not there. And she's okay when you're there, right? Yeah, she she is the calmest dog that you could ever right. think of when we're there. But when when we're gone, she uh, she freaks out. Well, of course, she's got separation anxiety. I think it's a big part of that. And I don't know if you can leave a TV running close to her, this sort of thing, something that might occupy her. Uh, some dogs do watch TV, look at it, and just the music may be a help. I wouldn't put any radical movie station on, but uh, just something that maybe occupy our time. What about <clears throat> leaving in the in the crate like a piece of clothing that would have the owner's scent on it? Would that help out at all? 
Depends on the dog. Some dogs would eat that. Uh, so you just have to be careful with what you, what you leave. That's a good we, we have We have one dog that we know quite well that literally eats holes in sheets or a blanket or whatever every day if, it's, if he has the opportunity. Hmm. And most of the time he can pass what he swallows, but he's had surgery once or twice as well because he can't. So you got to be careful with fabrics, uh, the ones that they can tear up and, and chew on. So what about, what, back to the crate size, is there maybe um, a general rule about how big a crate needs to be in relation to a dog? Although, as again, we've talked about this being a big dog, it probably needs a big crate. But when you're getting a crate, what are some things to keep in mind about uh, what type to get or how big? Right. We had a uh, Dogo Argentina, and uh, the crate was very comfortable for her. Uh, and. You could leave her in that with some food and water, a small amount of food and water. Um, I suspect something, though, for a dog this size, probably you're going to need, I'm just guessing now, something of like three by six. They make the wire crates, uh, heavy-duty wire crates that big, and you need to go online or look and just see what is available. But uh, they also make quote, indestructible toys, and go online and check that out. Uh, we found one manufacturer that uh, stood behind their product, and it, it, it they're made where the dog could not tear it up, so that was, that was pretty good. They occupy their time trying to tear it up, but um, it's, it's something you might consider. All right. So good morning, Dennis. We enjoy having you on the show with us. Um, we love when you talk about fishing as one of Mississippi's most popular outdoor activities. When's the last time that you went fishing? I went fishing with my brother uh, several months ago, too long ago, in fact. And we just fished in a river in East Texas, and uh, we had some worms, and uh, we weren't there that long. We just tight lined worms and watch the river flow and the logs go by and the wildlife around. What about a current uh, spot that you like to fish at? Well, I, uh, I think my, my favorite spot would be, right now anyway, would be the shorelines along uh, Pelahatchee Bay, mm -hmm. uh, perhaps uh, some land adjacent to some boat ramps, and there's several parks over there, yeah. So what it is about that spot that you like? Well, it's uh, it's like a lot of spots. Uh, one, uh, it's peaceful, and I get to observe nature, and I get to observe the 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 uh, ripple of the uh, the water as it's affected by wind, and the changing uh, you know sky, uh, the birds flying around, the colonial water birds, some occasional waterfowl, and the songbirds in the woods, and. Uh, the animals on the shoreline could be frogs, could be turtles, men are swimming around. So that line that you started off with is not an original line. There was an outdoor writer uh, that wrote for the times Picayune in New Orleans when I was growing up. And that was his, uh, you know, sign-off line. And I think it, in, it captures, in a short sentence, it captures everything that... Uh, I believe to be wonderful about fishing because in today's world, you know, we've got competitive bass tournaments and crappie tournaments and, you know, high school bass fishing clubs. And it all seems to be about competition. Even reality shows on TV, they're going to show one mining company against another. And, you know, this, this company got more logs out than the other one and, and all that stuff. But to me, <clears throat> Catch is just a small part of the experience, and it's not why I go fishing. I'm not what I would consider a proficient fisherman. Um, I learned a couple of things from my dad, and um, I fished in the uh, Bayou St. John and City Park when I would go home from college, and I fished in high school, and then when I got in the work, working world, my fishing activity uh, fell off, and so nearing retirement, I uh, plan to make amends and, <laughs> and do that. But it's a total experience. It really is. And, and studies have shown 
we've asked people, why do you go fishing? The number one reason is to get outdoors. Number two is to spend time with family and friends to socialize. Um, three would, you know, is up there somewhere is relieve stress, get away from the demands of work and spend time with your family or friends, uh, socialize. And uh, you're not sitting in the confines of your house or apartment, trailer, watching TV <laughs> or listening to music. You're experiencing, you know, just the variety of things that nature has to offer. Libby was talking about just her walks. Well, fishing is like that, you know, and uh, you never know what you're going to see. You have an idea of what you might catch. You never know how much you're going to catch. You never know how big they're going to be. It's like when fisheries biologists go electrofishing. We we know what some of the common sport fishes are in the lake are, but um, you never know where you're going to find them. Never know how many is going to pop up at one time. You never know how big a, a, a bluegill you're going to catch. Uh, you might see some other species and, you know, birds, and and you might see some fish jumping out of the water like carp or gar. You might run across a, a time of the year when the fish are spawning, and there'll be all kinds of activity, and they'll be frolicking around in the water. and Or if you're offshore, you know, you see bass feeding on shad and shad jumping out of the water. The same thing happens offshore. You can be miles and miles offshore in heavy seas, and you see, you, you know, menhaden and, and, and other bait fish just going crazy. Well, something's after them. Could be redfish, could be tuna, you know. Uh, so along these lines, okay, so fish and wildlife agencies, state fish and wildlife agencies, never marketed. You know, we we did radio shows, we do TV shows, we have a magazine, we have a newsletter. But we didn't really need to market because the source, the main source of our income is hunting and fishing licenses and, and uh, boat registrations. And so, you know, the numbers stayed pretty stable, but now they're going down. And so it's like, uh-oh, our revenue is going to be affected. We're serving less people. What can we do? to get more people to experience what we have. What benefits can we relate to them? How am I going to sell Kevin on going fishing or trying fishing? Or if he's a fisherman, take someone else that you know. A kid down the street perhaps doesn't have a dad at home with him. Your cousin, you know, a high school buddy who's never experienced fishing. And you'll get out there and you'll try. You might never catch anything, but you're trying, and uh, hopefully you'll get you'll get the bug, as we call it. You get hooked, okay? <laughs> Definitely. Oh, and I, I will mention in the interest of being equality, I guess. Now, I remember at one time the numbers were actually that we had a few more women fishing than men. Of course, we joked that the retirees were probably pushing that over the, the edge, but, yeah, it's it's... It's not a, a male sport nearly to the degree. And there are a lot more women hunting, I think, than there used to be. But there have always been a lot of women fishing. But it's a great excuse to get outdoors, hang up your apron or whatever <laughs> when, in the old days and get outdoors. And I think more and more for our family, that is the reason that we go fishing. It's the excuse to get outdoors. And so what Libby brought up, let's say you got a daughter at home or you've got cousins that 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 are female don't automatically say well they won't be interested in this you never know mm -hmm. just expose them to it and see and some people it's not going to be for them but some people you know if you never tasted chocolate ice cream do you know if you're going to like it or not <laughs> you know so and and what libby said nowadays in the fisheries profession i've been going to to professional fisheries meetings for 35 years in the Southern Division. And this is where students and, and researchers and management biologists, they present, you know, a study that they're going to be doing or this is what's going on in our lake. The number of women and minorities in the fisheries profession now, students, is incredible. I never thought mm -hmm. we would reach this level. And it's a good thing. It really is a good thing. You know, yeah. I, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, we might see if our listeners want to call in, tell us a little bit about their most memorable fishing trip. That can be 
to the well, yeah. closer the, uh, the and, mine is. And, yeah. and why it was memorable. What impressed you about it? Would you want someone else to experience something like that? All right. The challenge has been thrown out there. So if you're if you love fishing and you're listening this morning, give us a call and let us share one of your favorite fishing stories or again, why you enjoy fishing. Fishermen love to brag about their success stories. Well, like I said, we're giving you the absolute <laughs> opportunity to do that on yeah. Creature Comforts this morning. And, you know, Dennis, I love the way you said that at the very beginning, all the different things that you can, you know, pay attention to while you're fishing. And the fact that I guess fishing takes a little bit of patience. It's not a high, you know, that you have the opportunity to go out and enjoy nature. But again, that was so perfect, all the different things that you can do while fishing. And then if you do happen to catch one, I guess that's just like icing on the cake. And, and you know, um, I get distracted because I observe all that, so I'm not paying as much attention to my cork or my lure in the water for strikes. So uh, you know, uh, I miss some fish, uh, but it's all part of the it's all part of the experience. Yeah. Now I, I'll say myself, um, I haven't fished in years. Um, but it was mostly a nostalgia thing when my grand my granddad when he was still able to take us he would he would go fishing. All of my most memorable stuff does not actually like after you were talking about it. No, nothing that I remember about fishing has anything to do with actually catching a fish. It was from seeing like the how big the catfish were growing in the in the pet in the pond beside, behind my granddad's house and stuff. And you know those things were like three foot long and eight foot or eight foot eight eight inch mouth and stuff. It was. Those were my favorite memories from fishing was just observing things and not not necessarily the sport or act of catching a fish. And, you know, people fishermen say, well, you got to be quiet. But I bet your grandfather reveals some stuff to you uh, about when he first 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 went fishing or something about in his past life that he never revealed to you before because you were there interacting with him, mm-hmm. and he Absolutely. was sharing some fishing knowledge with you. And and uh, so instead of, you know, focusing on our electronic devices and the Internet, we're actually talking to, to, to someone. And uh, you're sharing a lunch or a snack or Coca-Cola, you know? Yeah, some, some crackers and uh, some sausages, <laughs> some canned sausages and crackers every time. Exactly. You know, what I like is uh, the park that I walk in in Pearl often has youth uh, fishing rodeos and that sort of thing. And I it, I do enjoy seeing the families get out there together. You know, there's the parents and then the, the little kids with the sort of kid-sized fishing rods. But, you know, that as, as Abram has clearly pointed out, that's going to really give a lot of memories that are going to last a lifetime. So, um, I, like I say, it's always fun to see that um, <clears throat> when I go out there. It's... Um, I don't know. I I kind of almost feel like I'm intruding or whatever, but when I'm walking, but like I say, I do like to see it, and, and there are, usually are a number of families out there, even though it's a kind of a small pond at the park where I walk in Pearl. So I'm Kevin Farrell here with Dr. Troy Major, veterinarian at the Animal Medical Center in Jackson, and Libby Hartfield, retired director of the Mississippi Museum of Natural Science. You're listening to Creature Comforts on MPB Think Radio, and today we're visiting with Dennis Rickey from the Mississippi Department of Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks. So if you have a question or a comment or specifically a fishing story that you'd like to share with us, maybe it's a, a fish that you caught, a trip that you went on, or to one of your favorite places to go fishing, email the show by sending it to animals at mpbonline.org. As I mentioned, we do have a couple of callers on the line that want to share fishing stories, so we start with our friend Kathleen, who calls us from Osaka. Good morning, Kathleen. You're on the air. Go ahead. Well, I started off in the morning, too, and uh, we were on a budget. And I didn't have access to a boat or anything like that, but I'm a wildlife nut. I admit it. A tree hugger, okay? But uh, I got uh, half of a whiskey barrel or one of those barrels that you find at the garden center, made a layer of rocks, made a thick layer of uh, peat, and then made a layer of sand. And I poked a couple of plants that I'd found in one of the little canals we have, and I got some glass jugs, uh, mayonnaise jugs, whatever, and I did it for my daughter when she was small. She's 52 now, so (laughs) I don't know. She'll even remember, but I gave it a jar to look into the water. Of course, I put a couple of minnows, a 
couple of pulley loads, different little things in the container. And uh, she watched the flowers bloom. She watched the animals. And when, before we know it, you know, we caught New Orleans doing the shoot to shoot. Like when their little hiney's sticking up in the air and they're leaning over with that glass and they're so intense they were looking at it. One time I had three or four kids with mayonnaise jars looking to this one book. And I said, I've never seen those kids so quiet. <laughs> but they got the idea. They saw the fish, a small habitat, but maybe it gave them some questions or some things. But I think they remember stuff like that. I think that, you know, just sitting here thinking, Okay, so let's say you can't go fishing right now or for the next week or so, and you want to see if your children may be interested in that, okay? So take them to the pet store and go to the aquarium section and just let them look around. You never know. They might say, uh, I'd like to have one of those at home. So you start with a goldfish bowl. And you're going to have to change the water every day, you know, put dechlorination drops in there, let it stand for 24 hours, and then you get to feed the fish. And they get to change the water. Uh, or shows on TV, nature shows. Uh, and and so, you know, they might get interested in it from, it might go on to the aquarium stage. Uh, or uh, you might have a kid in the scouts and suggest a, a fishing merit badge. You know, something like um, that. She graduated to the aquarium when she was in high school and always was bringing home like a turtle stranded on the road. We had a lot of water turtles around, so she would take it, make sure we walked down to the canal, put it back in. And uh, I also rescued a lot of what we call wild birds and brought them to the Ottoman Zoo. One had a turtle uh, that had jumped up, snapped its leg, and I couldn't get it off. So we got a net, pulled it up, you know, rescued it. Not that it was any big deal in the whole wild world, but she saw me rescuing the, the animal, you know. But it, I think it's very, very good to bring the children into it. Yeah, and so the fishing rodeo part of it, we do about 60 fishing rodeos a year, and um, the, the we will bring catchable size channel catfish to... Um, state fishing lakes, state park lakes, or community lakes uh, that we have an agreement with, or we don't even have to have an agreement with them. But the idea is to make it convenient for parents to bring kids fishing. You don't have to have any equipment. Uh, Fishing does not have to be an expensive sport. You can learn how to fish with a a cane pole, uh, which has line, a bobber, and a hook on it. And you just need some crickets that you catch or some worms or pieces of bread. And uh, so you got it. Um, But uh, the thing I wanted to say is that it's not an instant gratification sport if you're totally focused on catch. So you have to have patience and you have to have determination. And, uh, you know, little kids, they'll they'll get distracted. That's okay. Let Let them go off and explore. You know, studies have shown that the best time fish have uh, fish. The best time kids uh, have in the woods is when there's when they're not given an assignment. Just okay, you can do whatever you want. You got free time. You got you got an hour. Now, um, just go out and do whatever you want. And maybe I'll ask you a question when you come back. What'd you see? You know, what'd you do? So uh, that's just some things to think about. All right, Kathleen, thanks for the call. We've got another caller on the line. Now we're off to uh, Jackson. Regina has a fishing story for us. Go ahead, Regina. You're on the air with us. Um, You know, fishing now for me almost has become only a memory. Uh, Because when I remember when I was a kid, I'm not, there's so many obstacles out here that reduce you from fishing. You have to almost own your own pond. Uh, You're not allowed to fish almost anywhere. You have to travel to have an experience. And your children can't walk down the street. And when I was young, you could just walk anywhere, any, any pond, on anybody's land you could fish on. But people don't allow you to do that anymore. Uh, and also, it's kind of unsafe for your child to be wandering around on their own. I, when I was young, my mother used to tell us, well, just we come home before dark. And we fish all over the neighborhood. And you could 
fish wherever you wanted to on the side of the road, the, the, the neighbor's pond. So a lot of these experiences have been taken away from us. And I guess a lot of those children, they don't have any choice but to uh, to sit around and look at their iPhones and whatever. A lot has been taken away from them. And uh, everything is so manicured now. You know, it was wild when I was coming up. Even, you know, you had uh, all the persimmons and fireflies and, and butterflies and so a lot of our our wonderful experiences have have been reduced by I guess by by the times that we live in. Even now, as an adult, I can't go a lot of places because I don't own a car. I have to drive to get there. And uh, and, and the nature around it has has been reduced. So I mean, not to complain, but I'm just saying times times have changed. Maybe maybe it's me, but I um. I just don't, I don't, I don't have a lot of access to water like I used to now that I got older. Well, yeah. what, what you say is true, uh, particularly in, um, when it comes to Oxbow Lakes in the Mississippi River Delta region. But we do have um, 20 state fishing lakes, 20 state parks. We've got 10 Tom Reservoirs, and Okatibi, Ross Barnett, Enid, Arkabutla, Sardis, and Grenada. Grenada has world-class crappie fishing, so it is going to take some driving to get there. Now, in local communities, we have a community fishing assistance program, which has got about 20 water bodies in it, I think. And it's in Oxford, uh, South Jackson, Clarksdale, Hernando, Olive Branch, Hattiesburg, uh, Carthage, uh, Walnut Grove. I'm just naming cities. And so those are uh, places that we manage in conjunction with the city uh, that provide public fishing opportunities. In the city of Jackson, you've got Lake Dockery. You've got uh, Flow Wood, uh, Crystal Lake and Flow Wood. Um, but in the absence of that, you know, if you're good neighbors— and maybe some neighbors will let you or your relatives and friends fish in their pond, you know, and, and respect their property and don't leave litter. And, and uh, it's just some, some ideas. Yeah. yeah, I think Regina's right that we have to work a little harder at it now than, than probably we used to. All right, uh, Regina, thanks for the call. Uh, interesting call. And, and as you say, Dennis, I guess that you, the, the wildlife fisheries and parks really does work hard to try to overcome some of the more modern obstacles to fishing. And also put a plug in for your website, because I think if someone is interested in fishing and where to go and that sort of thing, that they, there's a bunch of information on, on, the, on the website. Yes, so the, the web address is uh, www.m for Mississippi. D for department, W for wildlife, F for fish, P for parks.com. And you'll see a bunch of tabs there when you open that up. And you'll see the rules and regs. You'll see a list of state fishing lakes, state park lakes, public waters, fishing reports, location of boat ramps on a map. You can search by water body. You can search by county for boat ramps. So that's our effort to provide access to get into rivers and and lakes all all the water in the state is basically public water except for that in private ponds it's owned by the state of mississippi and the public has a right to use it the problem is if all the adjacent landowners around that water body will not let you go on their property to reach the shoreline you can't use it so that's where our uh, boat ramp program comes in and peer program we have to either buy lands or secure a lease from someone to build a boat ramp. And if we have that, we will. Um, and this leads into the whole thing of marketing. Right now, the Mississippi Department of Wildlife, Fisheries, and Parks has 13 people in marketing. We have a staff photographer. We have three graphic artists working on various brochures. They lay out uh, uh, the Outdoor Digest. They do the... Uh, six times a year Mississippi Outdoors. Uh, we have uh, social marketing people. Uh, so uh, we have a marketing director. So you'll see in the coming months, you'll see an expanded website. 
uh, that's hopefully easier to navigate for you with the priority information right on when you click on open at a page. And with the new licensing system, uh, you take me, for example. They will know everything that I bought, every hunter edge course or boating education course I went to, a fishing rodeo, and we'll, they will be able to target marketing me. They'll know my age, you know, they'll know where I live, and we will be able to send uh, people emails about specific events coming up we think they may be interested in, reminders to renew your license, things like that. So uh, it's really going to be a ex- very expanded marketing effort. Uh, we were chatting, Libby, uh, in the break about a query. Again, I, I know it's aquariums or aquaria, but... Uh, <laughs> I, know, I think it's both nowadays. I can't tell. <laughs> But that's a way to introduce uh, people to fishing and to get people more interested in, in, in what's under the water, I guess. Yeah, if you want to know what's going on under the water. Um, I know the museum here in Jackson and the one on the coast and most museum, most aquariums, public aquariums, have um, aquaria set up as a individual habitat. So you can, like, if this is a riverine environment, the Mississippi River whatever. So you can go and get a good idea of what you would see if you're in that habitat. And it's it's real fun to see what's under the water when you're sitting in that boat or when you're standing on the bank looking. If you've ever wondered what it looks like underneath, go to a, an aquarium and you can find out. One of the things I was talking about in the break is you know, when uh, going fishing as a kid, we would always catch lots of brim, bluegill, whatever you want to call them, uh, panfish. Some people just call them because they are good to eat. And uh, we would always catch. That's what we would always catch. And you want to catch a bass. And we might very occasionally in our childhood catch the bass, but mainly we were catching those brim. But when you watch in the aquarium, the brim will just immediately, you're feeding things, it's, it's fun to go at feeding time to the aquarium. And mm-hmm. you can call the museum and they'll tell you when they're going to feed so you can be there to watch them. But the, um, the brim would just swallow pretty much anything you throw in the water <laughs> they're going to swallow. So that's why they're, they're biting at that marshmallow or that piece <laughs> of bread or my cricket or whatever. But uh, a bass... You throw it in there. I mean, they've got to know that it's not connected to anything. They're not, they're not that wild a bass anymore. They get fed all the time. But they are so careful with whatever they swallow. <laughs> and they have this thing. They can suck in something and spit it out in a split second. And usually when you throw in like a worm or anything you're going to throw in there, a little minnow, they'll spit it out three or four times before they'll hold it in their mouth any time at all. Hmm. And you know that's what they're doing to their hook. You know, you're, you're, mm-hmm. you're, you're bait on the hook. Mm-hmm. So that's why a bass is harder to catch than a brim. <laughs> uh, New Orleans has an excellent aquarium as well. Yes. Went to that uh, probably a year or yeah, so Yeah, on the Mississippi Gulf Coast, <clears throat> New Orleans, Atlanta, Memphis. Chattanooga. Yeah, in addition to the one here in Jackson. So they're all great to see. Back to the phone lines we go. Off uh, to Burnsville, I think it is. Deb has called in today. Good morning, Deb. You're on the air with us, so go ahead. Good morning. My question is, um, we live up in the northeastern section of of Mississippi, and we fish out on the Tennessee River. And we've caught fish and brought them in to clean, and then I read an advisory that it was not safe to eat. Are there lakes and ponds around Mississippi, northeast Mississippi, where you can catch the fish and eat them? Yes. Does that make sense? Yes, there are. I'm not aware of a an advisory or a mercury or a um, pesticide advisory on the Tennessee River, not in the Mississippi portion anyway. Um, but yes, we have several state parks and state fishing lakes uh, around Tupelo, Saltilla, Lake Lamar Bruce, uh, Tippa County Lake, Elvis Presley Lake. Um, I don't think of the other ones. Um, yeah, and and so and then you have the state parks, uh, Trace State Park, uh, J.P. Coleman, um, there's a couple other ones up there, uh, Tishomingo. You can rent canoes and, and on Bear Creek. You know, there's a marina at J.P. Coleman. 
So there's, you know, a small entrance fee to get into those to fish. You can camp there. They've got uh, bathhouses and restroom facilities. There's pavilions that you can rent if you want to have a big family gathering. Um, there's no charge to enter. You can go in, drive around, look at the facilities. You know, they're well kept. Uh, the restrooms are clean. There's no litter. The grass is cut. You know, there's fishing piers at all those locations. Great bank, bank fishing access and boat ramps, too, if you want to take a boat. All right, Dad. Thank you. Appreciate your calling in this morning. Uh, we've got William from Starkville. Looks like a, a cat question coming for Dr. Major. William, go ahead, please. Yeah, I, I, I wish we had time to go into fishing. I spent four years in high school working for, for some fishing lodge 400 miles up the Ottawa River from Montreal. Boy, it was so exciting. We caught The day we caught a sturgeon, when the people went crazy. They'd never seen one. And, and getting smelt off the smelt runs off Lake, Ontario, Lake Erie and Lake Ontario were exciting, too. But my cat question is this. I've got a 19-year-old a cat who's healthy and active, and I'm curious when she, when she uh, uh, poops in the hall, uh, for, she started doing that and, and not going into her litter box for some strange reason a month or two months ago at most. And when she does, she tears around the house at high speed like she's excited. And, uh, and uh, I'm just curious if there is a quick answer. I don't, I don't want any guesses or any speculation. I just yeah. wondered if anybody knows who turns a cat on at that moment. Right. Uh, that's, a, that's a great question. I, does she, do you feel like she has arthritis? No, no, she's perfectly healthy. She's absolutely. She, I just spent wasted five hundred dollars worried about her, her starting to not use the litter box, and, uh, right. and it cost well, five hundred dollars to find out that she's still healthy. <laughs> well, that's that's interesting. Yeah, but she's not using the litter box. Is that correct? At all? Well. Now, it's at night. It's at night, and and I quit feeding her at night, and that seems to slow her down. But then uh, I have to get up once or twice myself, and she usually uh, indicates that she wishes there was something to eat. But uh, as I say, uh, that seems to have diminished the uh, the habit somewhat. Is but it is it defecation and urination? Both, both no, 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 urine no. and, and, and it's dried cat food so that it doesn't even doesn't even spoil the carpet. So <laughs> we're lucky in that regard. Okay. okay. Is it in the same place every time? Uh, much the same place. Yeah, she, generally in in the same location. Yeah. Okay. And if she checks out good health wise, no sign of arthritis, which is good. My suggestion is yes. Let's do an experiment and put another litter box out in that area where she's going. Uh, that might help. The fact that she has a burst of energy after having defecated still makes me wonder if there may be some arthritis going on. Which at 20 years old, I would suspect there is some. Uh, that's quite, quite an old cat. It sounds like you've taken great care of her. There is a medication that can be given uh, called um, your vet can, can help you with that, uh, and you might ask him about that just to see. We have an old cat here at the clinic that has responded to that. She's probably 15, 16 years old, but uh, there, there may be some underlying cause that your vet, even though you spent $500, did not come up with. I try another litter box first and see what she does. All right, uh, William, thanks for the call. That is going to wrap us up for today. Creature Comforts is a production of Mississippi Public Broadcasting Think Radio with funding provided in part by listeners like you. To hear today's show or previous show, you can visit creaturecomforts.mpbonline.org. Our show is produced by Abram Nanny. So for Dr. Troy Major, Libby Hartfield, and our guest Dennis Rickey, I'm Kevin Farrell. Inviting you to stay tuned because up next at 10, it's autocorrect. And we'll be back next Thursday at 9 for Creature Comforts, heard only on MPB Think Radio. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app to listen on your iPhone or Android phone on demand.